make this an especially useful conversation for you today? Um, well, I am preparing for the LSAT. I took it before, um, didn't score well. The biggest thing for me is the language barrier. English is not my first language. Um, and I have a hard time, especially in a reading comp section, or also I would say um, on the um, on the other on the two other ones um, on the other you know the other sections because um, there's a lot of words that are hard to understand and then doesn't help uh, answering the questions. Of course. Yeah, that's a common issue for non-native English speakers. And unfortunately, there's not a magic bullet for that. It might just take longer to acclimate yourself and familiarize yourself with all the difficult vocabulary tested on this exam. How many reading comp passages have you done? Um, I haven't counted, but I've done a lot of them. Um, to be honest, I like more the, the game section, so I tend to not do them that often the reading comp because i'm like oh i like the games let me focus on them it's just more fun to do so i haven't done as many as i should have done it's just that they're so long and um i have a hard time concentrating the biggest thing on them is when i took uh, a class um for the outset um they said every for every paragraph to do one sentence to uh, to put it together in one sentence and um, I have a hard time doing that. So I end up pretty much rewriting uh, most of the reading comp while I'm uh, studying or taking a practice test. Yeah, well, I think that a good first step would be being able to summarize each paragraph in a single sentence. Ultimately, on test day, I'd like you to get to the point where you might only write down a few words expressing the author's opinion or the primary purpose or the main idea. But paraphrasing is extraordinarily useful to help you prove to yourself that you understand what they're saying. And as an exercise while you're studying, to do that sort of summary, I think, could be useful, especially for you if reading comps a particular struggle. And you could make a game out of it, make a drill out of it, and just do more passages. Of course, it makes sense to focus on your weak areas. So set some bar for yourself where you're going to do at least two passages a day or at least four passages a day between now and test day so that you can practice the material that you need to work on. Okay. Now, um, another thing that is kind of scary is when I took the test, it was the, you know, the old fashioned way on pen and paper. And now I know that it's digital. Um, it's a little scary because I don't know if they're going to have uh, scrap paper to, to, you know, do the uh, scratch paper to do the, um, while you're doing the reading comp to make little notations. I know that you can highlight um, and underline stuff on the digital one, but still, it's a little scary that has me a little bit uh, worried. Sure. Well, perhaps I can at least reduce a little bit of the stress because I can tell you for a fact that you will have scratch paper on the LSAT. They will give you a booklet of about 12 to 14 pages, eight and a half by 11 paper for all sections. So you'll have oh, wow. a few games, reasoning, reading comps, so any games, diagrams you want to make, any little notes you want to make for reading comp, you can do all of that. And as oh. you said, there is a highlighting and underlining tool on the digital, but it doesn't work that well, so I wouldn't rely on it. I would use the scratch paper with your pen or pencil as well, instead, really. Right. Makes, makes sense. Because I'm using um, the uh, online one, I'm using it a little bit, and... To highlight, it's a nightmare. You can't do it. It takes me like uh, a long time to highlight, and I'm just wasting so much time just trying to highlight a word when I can just move on and read the whole thing and try to um, to do a summary of it. Yes, you've already discovered that it's not really worth the trouble, and you're better off just using your scratch paper, but know that you have it available, and you have more than enough, really. It's not unlimited, but I think it's more than almost anybody would ever need. So just get used to doing that where, where while you're doing like the ones on LSAC's site or you're studying out of books or using PDFs, whatever you're doing, just do all your work to the side. And if you're using books, treat them like a screen and don't write on them at all. Right. The, um, when it comes to uh, reading comp, do you think I'm doing the right 
approach for now. I'm trying to, I, I, I can't, I have a hard time doing it in a sentence. Um, I try to do it in a sentence, the paragraph, but I'm doing a little more than a sentence, a few sentences per paragraph. Not a few, but maybe I have two or three sometimes. I Is can certainly right understand that. Yeah, I can certainly understand that. I mean, I, you, if you were trying to encompass all the information, then yeah, your summary, quote unquote, summary might be as long as the original, right? So we have to yeah. figure out what type of information do we want to pull out of the passage. And that's not all the information. It's specific, specifically structure-related information, like the different parties expressing different viewpoints. So you want to know what person or what group or what school of thought is on one side of a debate or issue and what is the other one or maybe there's two or three or four or maybe there's only one but whatever they are you want to look for who if anyone's advocating something and what are they advocating the details the supporting examples the evidence all of that i would leave aside you can come back to that later but in terms of making a summary just really i would write down a few keywords describing the author's opinion or if there are a couple of groups describing each of their positions, but that's it. Okay, that, that's uh, a little clearer, more helpful than um, I just pretty much rewrite the whole thing. Um, the, the arguments, I was, I was uh, watching your videos um, that you've done about the arguments and how to, to go about them. Um, it, was, it was helpful, but I'm still a little bit like I tried to, I, I saw the video about the, the, that you did about the restaurant and the Yelp reviews. Um, and I thought that was like very interesting how you, you uh, talked about all the types of the arguments and it, it kind of like was an eye opener for me. Um, but still, I, I don't know. I find the, I know not everyone, but I find the conclusion and I find the evidence and then um, like, Specific ones like necessary assumption, I have a hard time um, finding the answer. Um, and sufficient assumption, I kind of mix them up. And the negation test is not my it's not my specialty. I don't know why. Okay, well, I would suggest that you definitely figure out how to tell the difference between necessary assumption and sufficient assumption. This is something that anyone can learn. You just have to commit the time to noting what are the key words in the questions and that tell you necessary versus sufficient that i can tell i can tell by the question i can tell the, when i read the question i can tell what kind of uh, argument it is it's just when i'm going to find the answer choice i get stuck <laughs> okay so at least you know the difference that's important and then you yeah. also have to keep in mind what is each type asking you to do because they're asking for different things I think of necessary assumption questions as being a very specific kind of must be true question where they're not really asking for new information. The correct answer is actually something that if we assumed the stimulus to be true, the necessary assumption would logically follow. It's implicit or within the argument already. So you want to gravitate towards more moderate language in the choices. So an example would be, if God created the world, then an underlying necessary assumption is that there is or was a God at some point. That would right. not be new information. That would be something that you could actually infer if you took the initial statement to be true. Right. I, I actually was, I was reading one that there was, on one of your videos, there was um, an article that had about necessary assumption that sometimes it reinstates the evidence and the conclusion it was like six points. I was reading a little bit um, yesterday. I'm thinking about other questions. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, I could talk a little bit about sufficient assumption, which is the flip side, which is actually asking for something completely different. That's asking for new information, if true, that would guarantee the argument 100%, leaving no ambiguity at all. And because mm -hmm. it's said to be sufficient, it could actually be broader or stronger than the initial argument. So an example here could be something like, this dog chased that cat. If we learned as new information that any dog will chase any cat, given the opportunity, that would apply to the specific case in the initial sentence. So a general <laughs> principle would guarantee a specific example. And that's where yeah. I have this article where I've laid out six of the most common formats for sufficient assumption questions. 
and they can be quite formulaic where you could actually diagram them. Okay. I, I think that, do, do you have one for necessary assumption as well? Well, necessary assumption questions are different. They're not formal logic related, so they wouldn't have those sorts of categories in the same way. They wouldn't be diagrammable. Sufficient assumption questions are often formal logic or deductive reasoning where you can mathematically predict the answer. But for necessary assumption, they're more inductive or informal logic, meaning that you have to think of them more in a real world way. And there could be lots and lots of underlying necessary assumptions, meaning that you can't, act, you can't always predict what the answer will be. Okay. That makes sense. When you're doing the, um, when you're doing the argument, what I have a hard time is language. It's just, it, it throws me off because it's like, um, the language that they use is not like an everyday language, not the examples that you're saying with a cat and a dog, you know, it's more like a complex uh, language that they use. Um, do you think, or do you have any strategies? Like, is there any way to simplify when you're, um, when you do find the evidence, the conclusion to help you find the answer or just, just read it the way it is and just find the answer, like to make it with your own words or, um, to make any way how to, um, to make it easier than just, you know, the, the, the arguments that are about so many different topics that are a little harder than everyday, you know, topic. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I would definitely recommend paraphrasing and simplifying the language in these questions. It's a great exercise to do. We talked a little bit about reading comp, just extracting the, the key information that you want, which would be viewpoints. In logical reasoning, yeah, if it's on a tough topic, dumb it down as much as possible. Just the same. I'll try to think about it as if I were trying to explain it to a five-year-old or seven-year-old and use very simple words like good and bad, even. Hmm. When the, even though the source material might be a lot more complex, we could say good versus bad or old versus new or right versus wrong, whatever the circumstances are. And a lot of times when they use an unfamiliar term, they will actually define it at some point in the stimulus. And so whenever you see that tough word, just substitute the definition that they give you. There's one question in exam number 64 about something called microglia, which are like the brain's immune cells. It's a science-y topic. And so whenever you see the word microglia, just say brain's immune cells. Substitute that phrase that's easier to understand and that makes it, more, it, makes it simpler to just get through, really. Um, the... Um Based on your opinion or what, what you've seen so far, the uh, writing portion, is that, um, is that something that I should study just like or, you know, put the effort just like the rest of the outset or that's something that, because, um, I mean, like I mentioned in the beginning, English is not my first language. And even though I know law school is going to have a lot of reading and writing, I don't, I'm not 100% confident with my writing. I could write an, I could write an essay, it's just that um, I, 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 when I took the test, I already did the writing portion, but I think I could have done better. Um, so I'm thinking, I don't know if I should redo it, or that's not that. I know it's not scored, but I know how important it is when it comes to uh, law school. Yeah, sure. And so for most applicants, the LSAT, the, num the numerical LSAT score is far more important than the unscored writing sample. So for most mm -hmm. people, I'd say don't really worry about it too much. But given that you are a non-native speaker and given that you said that you think you could do better, I would definitely suggest that you redo it. I think that the, your numerical LSAT score will still be more important in the end. But a lot of times with non-native English speakers, they want to make sure that you do have English proficiency and will be set up to do well in law school, given that it has a lot of writing involved. So I would say, yes, definitely do the digital LSAT writing sample and do some studying for it. Do some practice runs through with different examples. Every exam has a published writing sample at the end, a writing prompt, and you can use that to just write a few and then have a friend or read it over, have a tutor read it over for you and give you feedback on how you could improve. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Uh -huh. Now, 
I know that you mostly talk about the outset, um, but I've, I took it twice already um, and didn't score good. I mean, from first to second, it, it got better, but didn't score good where I could even make it to law school. And um, I'm thinking to take it in April before I took it later on, not I took it in June. Um, I'm thinking to take it in April, but do you think I'm going to be penalized for, you know, taking it for the third time? How bad that's going to look for um, law schools when I apply? And do you think I should maybe write an addendum about why I had to take it so many times and why I scored bad or explain myself? Sure, sure. For taking it three times only, I don't think you need to write an addendum for that. I think if you take it five, six, seven times, then it starts to look like you're not taking it when you're going to be ready. And that might make them question your judgment. But I think three times is perfectly reasonable. No explanation necessary. Really? Really. Yeah. People retake more often than ever before because law schools do not average multiple scores. They only take the highest score. And given that they're making the LSATs more frequent, there's more opportunities to take it. People are going to take advantage of that, and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, but I, but I know they can still have act, they will have access. And but the thing is that I actually didn't explain. I applied when I took it the second time this June 2019. I I applied to a few law schools and I got denied. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to have to redo the whole thing all over again. Yeah, yeah, you will, and so so be it. But if you have a higher score that opens up the doors that you previously weren't able to open. That's totally understandable why you would retake it if you wanted to do better and you needed to do better. That alone, I think, is its own explanation. Right. I guess it makes sense. Yeah. Um, it, it's a little scary. Um, I never thought I would have to take it three times. So um, that, that's what has me so worried. And I'm, I'm trying to do my best this time because I don't want to take it again after this time. Sure. Yeah, it's a common concern. I definitely understand it. I mean, people never expect to have to retake the LSAT more than once, if at all. People underestimate just how difficult this exam is. And certainly being a non-native English speaker, I think it's even harder given the vocabulary. It's hard for native speakers enough as it is. So the fact that you might need to take it more times or might need to reapply is totally understandable. Yes, it is. But um, the... Um, the new one, that, that is a big worry to me because the two times that I took it was, you know, um, the old traditional way. Based on what you've heard, or I don't know if you've uh, taken, I know some people will go and just sit to see how it is. Is it going to be, is it harder to take it um, on a computer? I than- think there are, there are pros and cons. There are pros okay. and cons. I think that, like you said, the highlighting tool not being that great could be an issue. If there are any tech issues with the tablet, that could be a problem. But issues aside, any tech issues aside, really, like a lot of students actually prefer it because there's no time invested in bubbling. For example, things are, can be a bit more smooth with one tap of the stylus or your finger. You've selected your choice. You can flag questions to come back to later. You can eliminate choices and they'll be grayed out. You can collapse them as well. So I think there's a lot of benefits to digital and you're practicing it. You went on LSAC's site, so you've seen the tests there. And that's really all you need, I think. I think that if you have a smartphone or you've ever used a tablet before, you have a general idea of what it's going to be like. And of course, the content's not changing at all. Right. But you don't have to do the, when when you do the um, the electronic one or doing the tablet, you don't have to do the, um, the bubbling sheet. Correct. Yeah. So the bubbling is all the bubbling is just on the tablet right there. So that saves you time. And then the writing sample, and then the writing sample, you're not even doing it at the test center anymore. You're doing it later from your own computer. And when you're going to be fresh and more awake and ready to go, and you also can type more quickly than you can write by hand most likely. And so that also gives you some extra time to review and edit your writing, which is nice. That is, that is. I, I didn't know about the, the bubbling sheet because I feel like that, that's um, one thing. The way I, how I do tests, um, I, will, I will select the correct choice and then in the end of the, if I have like three, four minutes left, I go put in 
the answer choice is in the bubbling sheet, then if I have any minute left, I will go back, try to answer a few more questions if I can. Right. Um, so that definitely is gonna save time. Um, and that I didn't read it any. I didn't. I didn't see that 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 was um, something that that doesn't need to be done, which definitely saves time. I'm glad you told me that. Of course. Well, we're about up for today, Lada. But what would you say is the biggest insight you got from our call today? Um. It was so, like I told you, I was reading with your videos, but it was more of a um, eye opener for me. I feel like now I have a better understanding how to work on the exam completely because you explained to me three quarters of the exam except the games, and the games is something that I enjoy doing them. Um, I, of course, there are some more complex and I need to work on them, but reading comp was, um, I'm definitely going to take your advice and I'm going to try to do um, to just select keywords and the opinions, the author's opinions and stuff like that. And that uh, I feel like that's going to help. And also when it comes to the argument, to simplify it and just um, do it like that so I can find the answer choices. And um, the sufficient and necessary assumption that I have some trouble. Um, I, I understand now uh, a little better and um, I'm definitely going to apply all the techniques that you told me today when I do a um, practice test and um, see how, how it goes. I'll keep you updated. Fantastic. Yes, please do. And let me know if you need anything in the meantime. Sure. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.